All right, so uh, it's good to be here again in the afternoon. Um, I'm not sure how long this sermon is going to be, so I hope you'll indulge me. <laughs> um, but I'll try and get through it as, as quickly as I can. Uh, but the sermon I have today, I was just reading through the book of Ezekiel, and, uh, and something came up. Uh, the sermon's titled Untempered Mortar. So the definition of mortar is a plastic building material such as a mixture of cement, lime, or gypsum plaster with sand and water that hardens and is used in masonry or plastering. So it's used to like plaster walls and to strengthen walls and, and strengthen buildings and things like that. And the definition for temper is, uh, there's two definitions here, 3A and, and 4, is the state of a substance with respect to certain desired qualities such as hardness, elasticity or workability, especially the degree of hardness or resiliency given steel by tempering. And the fourth definition is a substance such as metal adding, added to or mixed with something else, such as another metal, to modify the properties of the latter. So both of these definitions, they'll fit the context of what we're talking about today. Um, both the hardness and the workability of the mortar, adding to or mixing the modifying the properties of the mortar. Um, and the principle I'm applying today is the tempered mortar of God's word compared to the untempered mortar of, of lying false prophets. So we're commanded to build our houses upon the finished work of Christ, the foundation of our faith, but how we, deter how we do that determines how well we're going to actually stand. Um, so before I get started, all of this sermon is going to be predicated on having the right foundation. So first, the foundation of Christ, obviously you need to be saved and have the Holy Ghost indwelling you, but also the foundation of the King James Bible. So there's no other, no other word in English is tempered like the King James Bible. All other versions are false and they are untempered mortar. Um, but the, the King James Bible, that's a complete word of God. Um, it's been purified seven times and preserved by God. So without believing that, you're open to a lot of error because you need your foundation to be right, the foundation being Christ and his word. They're the two foundations that everything must be built upon. Um, and it, you can easily be misled by lying false prophets who use different, if, like if you don't have the King James Bible and they're using the NIV or some other version, they can easily lead you into, into false doctrine. So that's why it's, it's so important and this entire sermon is predicated that you believe that the King James Bible is the perfect translation in English, you know, that it's, the, it's the word of God, it's complete. So like when someone tries to trick me by asking if I believe something society Society might say something's acceptable or unacceptable, you know, but the Bible says it's right. Then the answer is always the Bible's right. It's yes. You know, it's always in the affirmative. And like regardless of, of whether it's popular or acceptable in today's culture, and that includes things like, you know, the teachings of adultery, the teachings of reprobate doctrine, um, the teachings of um, women keeping silence in church, wives obeying their husbands, children obeying their parents, you know, women wearing that which pertaineth to a man. Like, these are all things the world says, well, these things are just unacceptable. But we say, no, the Bible says this is, and we find this acceptable because the Bible says it. And that's why our foundation is strong. And, and the, the, the Bible is the tempered mortar, so it's just going to build strength upon strength. So we don't need to excuse the Bible because we just believe what it says. You know, God is right and the world is wrong if it opposes what the Bible says. So... Just imagine how messed up your doctrine can get if you don't believe in the preservation of God's Word. Um, so we're just going to go through a few verses on preservation. There, we've done entire sermons on that too here. Um, but, you know, this, like, you know, they go into more detail. But it's the foundation of our faith. It's something that's so critical for us. So I'll just read you a few verses. Psalm 12, verse 6, we all know this one. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So it's not man's job to preserve God's word. God preserved it. That's why we don't have to worry, because if he says it's preserved, it's preserved. Second Peter 1.19, We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, So God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So the Lord has spoken to us. He did that through his prophets in the Old Testament, and lastly by his Son, Jesus Christ. You know, And when, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, 
he responded in Matthew 4, 4. He said, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So again, how can I live by every word if God didn't preserve it? Like, we know that he did preserve it. And even Jesus is saying, look, the word, is, it's written. It's written, the, the prophets wrote, and Jesus quoted them. And they were quoted all through the New Testament. But it can lead, you know, it can lead to so much error and untempered mortar if you don't believe in the preservation of God's word, which is the King James Bible for us today in English. But prior to that, it was preserved in the Greek and in the Hebrew, you know, in the, in the lingua franca of the day. So, and, and in 1611, that, of course, was English, so it was translated into English. And it's the first time it was ever actually complete um, that you had the Old, the Old Testament, New Testament all together in one book. You know, that didn't exist in one language before then. So, like, how lucky are we to have that? But you can see also that can lead you into error that, uh, you know, if you don't believe they had the Word of God before 1611, then how could people get saved? Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If there was no Word of God back then, then how could people get saved? But we know that there's an unbroken chain between us and John the Baptist all the way up through. The people heard the gospel, believed it, and got saved. And they had the word of God, because you can't get saved without the word of God. So there hasn't been a generation where they didn't have the word of God. They just maybe didn't have it as accessible as we do today. But the word of God has existed. So now we're just going to get into the chapter the servants derive from. If you want to go to Ezekiel 13. But you can see how a doctrine that may not seem that dangerous, like the preservation, preservation of the scripture, can actually lead you to some pretty bad doctrines. So we'll start in verse 1 of Ezekiel 13. But this is in the context of uh, he's speaking to false prophets. These are liars and false teachers. So 13 verse 1, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophet that follow their own spirit. So they're not doing it by the Spirit of God, they're doing it by their own vain imaginations, by their own spirit, prophesying out of their own hearts. He says, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit, and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. So they're lying, and they're just hoping someone else will come in and say, Yeah, yeah, I got the same thing. I heard the same thing, you know. That's, that's what God's trying to say today. Like, this, this is what these people are doing, and God's going to rebuke them harshly for this. But he says, Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination, whereas you say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken? Thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies. Therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. You know, how frightening is that when God is saying, Look, I'm against you because you're saying that I told you this and you didn't, I didn't tell you this. You're lying to my people. It says, because even, in verse 10, because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore saith the Lord God, I even will rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So I will break down that wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it down to the ground, so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I am the Lord." Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar. That's the lying false prophets. It says, and we'll say unto you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. So again, how scary is that when the Lord is against you in this manner? See, when a false prophet teaches lies, he's building a wall of false doctrine. And that's a fa false foundation also that others will build upon with untempered mortar. And then the purpose of the sermon today 
It's to outline the importance of first setting your foundation on truth and then building thereon, building on it with the, the tempered mortar of the word of God and the truth. Because you first must be established in truth and then you can temper the mortar with more truth. So I'll get you to turn to Ezekiel 22 and I'll read to you from Psalm 31. That was the chapter we read just before. It says, I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. And like the author, we also should hate those lying vanities. You know, we, and let alone we should not be using them to build upon the foundations of our faith. You know, so we have the word of God and his truth is absolute. His truth never changes. And our foundational doctrines must be built on the truth of what God says in the Bible. And these foundational doctrines are salvation by grace through faith, without works. So that means there's no works, no works at all. Doctrines like eternal life and the resurrection. Uh, doctrines like the Godhood, the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, the triune God. Like these are all foundations. And these, if, you're, if you've got a misunderstanding of any of these foundations, then you cannot build tempered mortar on top of that because it's just going to fall down. And you also can't build uh, with, with false doctrines, false foundations like dispensationalism, Zionism, oneness, um, you know, work salvation, any of those things, because they can't even stand up to the most basic scrutiny of the Word of God. But you'll find that it's not only unstable, but they're also ever-changing, these doctrines, because they have to continually come up with new lies to, to cover the old lies. Whereas if you just preach the truth, you never have to cover for anything. So you're there in Ezekiel chapter 22. If you just want to look at verse 24. Ezekiel 22, 24. says, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. So, I mean, to get dishonest gain, that's making merchandise of you. This is what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 1. It says, But there are also false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So Peter's warning is, again, here, that like the New Testament, there's no difference between that and the Old Testament. There was people coming in, wolves to devour then, and there's going to be wolves coming in to devour us too. So we need to watch out for that. Uh, in verse... Verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So we've got to be very wary of these kind of people. They'll come in, they'll, they destroy you not only for pleasure, but also for money, you know, for the gain of this world. First Timothy 6, 5, it says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. They have no truth. It says, Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So people who think money is the, is the be-all and end-all of everything, you know, people who think gain is godliness, the richer they are, the better that God loves them. Like, there are people who think that way, but we're to withdraw ourselves from those people. We're to avoid them, to rebuke them sharply, and we should also name and shame them to warn others of the dangers of having to avoid them. So you'll still be there in Ezekiel 22. Look at verse 28. It says, And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies under them, saying, The Lord, thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. 
Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Now I can tell you that I've been in churches, and I know Brother Jason would agree, I've been in churches where these kind of people do exist. They oppress you, they rob from you, because they're after greedy, you know, they're greedy for money. And these are the pastors of a lot of these wicked churches, where they just, all the money just belongs to them and they steal it for their own purposes, you know, and, and even get found out, in, in, um, like this, there's a, there's a case around here up north, where a pastor was just let go because they were embezzling funds. It's like how wicked of a heart must you have to make merchandise of the people and then embezzle the funds from God. You're stealing from God. But that's where you need a man to stand in the gap. And when we get up here to preach, that's what we do. When you go home and you pray for the church, that's what you're doing. You're standing in the gap. And we're daubing the tempered mortar, which is the foundations that we believe you know, of good doctrine. But we must not be like these people who God's warning us against here. There's false prophets, they daub with untempered mortar of lies and deceit. Um, and they cause God's people to fall. I'll read to you from Deuteronomy 13. It says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord with your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. So here's an example of where these, these prophets, they get, you know, they predict, they, they do, you know, prophesy something and it comes to pass. Now, we're going to read here in a second where, you know, he says, uh, actually, I'll read to you now, in Jeremiah 28. It says, The prophet which prophesieth the peace, when the, word of the, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. But here we see in Deuteronomy, a prophet's being sent to lie and to take people away after other gods, to test them, to see if they will actually follow other gods or if they truly love God. And sometimes a prophet, yeah, they, you know, they may appear like they're a real prophet, but if they're trying to get you to do something the Bible says don't do, then they're a lying prophet. And they may have even been sent by God to test, to see whether you're going to follow God or if you're going to go after sin or go after this wickedness. And that's, this is what he's doing with the people of Israel here. Uh, we see in Jeremiah 7, 4 as well, Trust ye not in lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. In Jeremiah 7, 8, he says, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. And in, se in verse 16 of the same chapter, he says, Therefore pray not thou for these people, neither lift up the cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. There's a time when God just gets fed up, when you're just continually disobeying, when you're continually listening to lying prophets. He says, You know what? You want to listen to these liars? You can go and believe the lies. We'll see that in a second as well. But they're teaching contrary to God's law. And the sin in the land, of course, was very great because when you teach against the commandments of God, the sin just thrives. And they wouldn't hearken to the prophets of God. But, you know, the lying prophets, are, we see they're, uh, they're spared and beloved of the people. Um, they're teaching lies in the Lord's name, but God is furious. So we'll look at Jeremiah chapter 29. If you want to turn to Jeremiah 29. We'll start in verse 17. And God constantly brings judgment on these false prophets, on these, those who daub with untempered mortar. In Jeremiah 29, 17, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. And I will persecute them with the sword, with the famine, with the pestilence, and will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and an astonishment and an hissing and a reproach among all the nations whether I have driven them because they have not hearkened to my word saith the Lord which I sent unto them by my servants the prophets rising up early and sending them but ye would not hear saith the Lord hear ye therefore the word of the Lord all ye of the captivity whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel of Ahab the son of Kaliah and Zedekiah the son of Maasiah, 
which prophesy a lie unto you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. So, I mean, you can just see how mad God is here with the lying prophets. He says, look, they've been lying to you. You've believed them, but I'm, I'm going to send them to Babylon. They're just going to be killed in front of you. That's how much God cares for these false prophets. And we should care equally as much, you know. We should pray that God destroys them. People who will lie in the Lord's name. Uh, in, in verse 23, uh, because they have committed villainy in Israel and have committed adultery with their neighbours' wives and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them, even I know and am a witness, saith the Lord. Again, we know God sees everything. So these lying false prophets, they can't hide anything from God. They think they're getting away with it because they're not getting judged right now. But their judgment will come. Proverbs 30 says, Add not thou unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So be careful when saying, God told me, or God said to me, you know, or God showed me, or anything like that. Because you can be adding to God's word if you're not quoting scripture and saying, well, God said, because that's all God said is in that book. In, uh, in Job 13, 7, it says, Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Like, I love that question because, yeah, there are many people who do. They speak wickedly for God. They put words in his mouth. And that's what God himself is accusing them of doing. When they profane his name by saying the Lord has said when he did not say, they're putting words in God's mouth. And again, you see how wicked that is, how much God hates that. You know, so we have the Bible, the King James Bible, that's the word of God, and outside of that there's nothing else. That's what he's given us, that's what he's preserved for us. So we have the complete word of God. And when you get up to preach, that's why we only expound that book. We only expound what we can find in the Bible, because that truly is the word of God, and that's what has power. Like, I have no power up here. My opinion doesn't mean more than anyone else's. But what the Bible says, I'm just going to share that and just spread the truth of what God says. And I just can't accept anything else as the Word of God. You know, you can say that God told you, but how do I know? What do I know? I only know what's in that book. I only know what the Bible says. In Romans 9.20 it says, Nay, but O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Like, I, I don't question the Bible, because God wrote it. So I don't question what's in it, I just believe it. Because God knows better than I. You know, Brother Sam preached well on that this morning. Okay. So in Ezekiel 13, verse 6, you remember we read that they have seen lying, vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord has not sent them. They've made others to hope that they would confirm the word. You know, whereas you say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. So these are lying teachers. You know, they're lying in wait to deceive. If you, turn in, if you just turn to 1 Kings chapter 13, and we're going to look at a story like Brother Jason brought this up um, in his sermon on Wednesday about this story. But you've got a prophet here who says, an angel, an angel by the word of the Lord told me. But there was no angel. He, he made that up, and the Bible even says he lied. But we'll see what happens to this poor guy. So we start in verse 7, 1 Kings 13 verse 7. It says, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I'll give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, drink no water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way, and returned not by the way he, that he came to Bethel. So he understands the command that was given to him. You're not going to stay, you're not going to spend the night, you're not going to eat, you're not going to do anything, you're not even going to go out the gate you came in, you've got to go out the back gate. You know, you've got to go out another way. So he understood that and he shows he clearly understood that because he's repeating that to the king. Now, you, like if you're going to let it slide for anyone, you'd think well, probably the king has invited me to stay for dinner, it'd be rude not to, but he's like, no, God commanded me, I can't do that. But then just watch what happens, verse 11 now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. They told him also to their father, 
And their father said unto them, Which way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then said he unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor, wa- nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way thou camest. And he said unto him, I am a prophet, as also as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him, and did eat bread in his house, and drank water. It came to pass, as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which, which the Lord God commanded thee, but camest back and has eaten bread and drunk water in the place, of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come into the sepulchre of thy fathers. <clears throat> and we see in verse 24, And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and an ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. So we see this man was, this man was killed. The prophet's the one who lied to him, the old prophet. But it's the guy who disobeyed God who ends up getting killed. He's the one who gets punished. And he had a clear word from God. He knew it because he repeated it twice. We see him repeat. But he listened to the lying prophet. It caused him to lose his life. And, you know, this is something that we have to understand too. People might try and, and even people you know, might try and convince you to break God's commandments or to do things contrary to what the scripture says. You know, and, and we see here that this guy, you know, the God spoke through this prophet, but, you know, at the first he lied to him, and I'm sure he got his too. I'm sure God judged him righteously as well. But, I mean, we've got to be careful with who we listen to. You know, if someone comes and, and tries to, you know, speak and say, well, the Lord told me or God said this and tries to get you to do something you know is against God's law, you need to go with God's law. You need to go with what you know. And that's why your foundations have to be so stable, that you know when, they, when people are lying to you. But that's the thing. These false teachers, they want nothing more than to watch us fall. God's people, they want to destroy us. They want to watch us fall. They don't love us. They don't love God. They just want to see us fall. If you want to turn to 1 Kings 22... But just think of how many people so far have died as a result of listening to these lying preachers. Like we've seen probably, you know, I don't know exactly how many, but you're talking at least a dozen people have died and we haven't even gone into all the examples of, you know, God judging these people. But how many people have died? Like this guy at least died. You know, you see when it comes to the false teachers that God just said, I'm going to slay them in front of Nebuchadnezzar. You know, like how many people have died because of these people? And they just want to bring you down with them. They know where they're going. They just want to bring you down with them. But do you think God cares less for his children now than he did then? Do you think he cares less for the church of God than he did for the nation of Israel? Look, he loves us the same as he loved them. So when he's this furious about people lying to his people then, you can be damn sure that he's just as furious when people lie to you now people want to destroy the people of God God does not take kindly to that and he'll he'll do anything even kill them you know because God's no respecter of persons he doesn't love them any less than he loves us so I'll read to you from Acts chapter 20 verse 28 it says take heed therefore unto yourselves and all to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. It comes back to that. You might know the guy who's trying to get you to to lead you away to other gods or to lead you on a false path, you know, to commit sins against the Lord. Even people of your own selves are going to rise up and be wolves. So you need to be careful. 
It says, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. You know, the Apostle Paul, he's constantly reminding all his churches of this problem. It's a real threat, and it's a threat that we need to be aware of. We can never let our guard down. You know, there's, there's people who, the walls will come in, they try and cause us to fall with a lying divination, saying the Lord said when the Lord did not say. So we'll see another example here in 1 Kings 22. You can also find a parallel in the Second Chronicles 18, another record of this. But we see here with, with King Ahab, and we get the false prophets telling Ahab good things. So verse 2, it says, It came to pass in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle, Ramoth, Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. So inquiring of the Lord is a good thing. That's something, you know, we can do every day. We can go to the Lord and inquire of him and say, Hey, what do you want me to do today? Like what? Guide my steps. I want you to guide me as I go through working today or whatever you're doing. Just pray that the Lord will guide your steps. But you can see his heart's not really to find out what the Lord has to say. He just wants to be told he'll be victorious. We see in verse 6, it says, Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. So these are the people who are saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know, they're prophesying lies to God's people again. And you just see that pattern everywhere. And again, don't think that this is just the Old Testament. This is happening in our churches too. And it's going to happen. You're going to see it. And he said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto him, unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Amiah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Amiah. So it says, And all the prophets prophesied before them. So they're all prophesying that he's going to be successful. But then we get down to, to Micaiah. It says in verse 13, The messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king, with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. And that's how we should be. What the Lord says, what the Bible says, that shall I speak. I don't speak what's, what I think they want to hear. I don't speak what, you know, maybe like my life is on the line, and I've got another sermon coming on that. You know, maybe, you, maybe your life is on the line, but you still got to preach what God puts in your mouth. And that's the word of God. That's the word of God we have. And we see Micaiah, he's a good prophet. He'll preach what the Lord says, even knowing it's going to see him in prison and could even lead to your death, which for all the prophets, all the prophets lost their lives for preaching the truth. But all the other lying prophets, they preach smooth things, those things that tickle your ears. They're pleasant to hear, but they're not of truth. But the man of God is the lone man standing in the gap, standing on the truth, even to his own hurt. And that's, again, that's how we should be. So we continue on, verse 15, 1 Kings 22. So Micaiah's preaching the truth now. Um, it says, so, came, so he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, they ha These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. 
It says, And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this matter, and another said on this matter. And there came forth the Spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth, and, so, and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. So we hear that all the good news that the kings were hearing. That was God's doing. God's the one who, who put the snare in front of them, you know, this lying spirit from before the Lord says, yeah, I'll go and I'll lie to him, tell him to go forth to battle so he'll be killed. But the lesson here is if you don't seek the truth with honesty, then you can be given over to the lie. God can just let you believe the lie. And we see more of that shortly. But it's imperative when you seek the truth, you seek it honestly. Don't seek it with a wicked heart, scoffing and mocking. You know, King Ahab and Joshua, they weren't seeking the truth, you know, uh, in honesty. And so God sent that lying spirit to let, let him believe the lie and to get killed through it. So we don't dismiss that just because it's uncomfortable or you don't like it. The truth is the truth and God's truth is absolute. So a couple more verses in First Kings 22, verse 33. It says, It came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him and a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. So I'll get you to turn to Malachi chapter 2. But what we're about to see here that... Uh, God has given us as priests, you know, where to preach the truth. We have the truth, so where to preach the truth. But you look at the result of when you, when you go following after lies, when you go following after deceivers, or worst case, if you're a deceiver yourself and you're leading God's people down a bad path, like God is, God is going to judge you and you are going to pay. You know, the Lord says, I will repay. Nobody gets away with anything. So in Malachi 2 verse 1 it says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And you shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. He was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And again, this is how we should be. You know, they should be we should fear the Lord. We should, they should find the law of truth within our mouth. Again, that's the word of God, that's the Bible. You know, and iniquity was not found in his lips. And because of that, he was, he was also not turning people away, uh, he was turning people away from iniquity. So he was preaching, you know, the commandments of God, saying, hey, you need to live a righteous life. You know, we should live according to the laws of God. And again, we'll see shortly that uh, Christ even commands us the same thing. And that's why he lived a life of peace, because that's how he was to God. Um, in continuing verse 8 it says but ye are departed out of the way ye have caused many to stumble at the law ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi saith the Lord of hosts therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according as you have not kept my ways but have been partial to the law so we see in Matthew five seventeen, this is Christ speaking it says think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets I, came not, I, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, which is exactly what these priests were doing, it says, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So if we're like those priests, we teach men to break the least of the commandments, then it says we're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord's not pleased with that. And you may pay on this earth. God may actually bring some, some real trouble your way on this earth if that's how you're going to, t- going to treat his people. But uh, I like how, it, you know, it clearly shows you can't lose your salvation, which is good, but you can lose your rewards um, if you start teaching people to break God's commandments or even break the commandments yourselves and start teaching others to. But if, on the other hand, if you teach the truth and you teach men to keep God's commandments, that's when it says that Levi had, you know, a covenant of peace with God because, he, you know, that's what he was teaching. He kept the law in his lips, you know. He was, he was teaching others to also, you know, to avoid iniquity and, and to live the best life they can. You know, obviously we have the, the new man. It's, it's a lot easier for us to walk in the Spirit as New Testament Christians, so we should be walking in the Spirit, you know. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, is what the Bible says. But, I mean, that seems like a pretty good deal to me. You know, you, you preach what's right, you just preach God's word and preach the truth, and God's pleased with you and you'll have a good life. I mean, that's a great deal. But if you preach lies, you're going to be punished. That's, that's the bad end of that deal. So, in Ezekiel chapter 20, I'll get you to turn to Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. Ezekiel 20 verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Wilt thou judge them, son of man? Would thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers. So, like, as we saw, they went and inquired of the Lord. But imagine if you went to ask God a question and he just said, look, I'm not even going to answer you. I want nothing to do with you. Like, I'm not going to be inquired of by you. Don't come to me with questions. Like, (laughs) how bad must you be to get to that point where God God even says, look, I don't even want to talk to you. I have nothing to say to you. Like, (laughs) just wow. Wow. But that's why it's so important to teach the truth and to not go- cause God to say that, you know, obviously to us, we're his children, but they still might get to a point where he's like, you know, I can't even look at you right now because you're just so far away from me. You're so deep in sin. I can't even look upon the wickedness. You know, you're not going to go to hell. You can still go on to heaven, but God may just not be able to deal with you because of the way you're living and he'll punish you for it. Yeah, and that's the thing, if you're lying to God's people deliberately and doing all those manner of wicked things, then he may say that to you. I don't know. I don't know how far he would go in his punishment for you or for me or for anyone. But that's why we should, you know, we should seek the Lord while he, while he may be found. And if we stand on the truth of God's word, then he will answer us and we can be a friend of God. So I read Psalm 70, 77 verse 1. It says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto the God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. And that's where we want to be with God, you know, in our walk. We want to be walking in the Spirit. So when we pray to God, it says, yeah, God has his ear. He gives his ear to us, as opposed to saying, well, I'm not going to be inquired of by you. You know, I've got no answer for you. You're on your own. And we've got Jesus and the rich young ruler. So he believed the lie, even after Jesus confronted him with the truth. You know, but Jesus didn't correct that he believed a lie. He just let him go on his way thinking he was still good. You know? Like, because you either understood that when Jesus said, he, there's none good but one but God, he's saying, well, look, I'm God. But this guy just goes, well, I'm good too. So he thinks he's God. And God didn't correct him. Do you notice that? He thought he was justified before God by his good works. You know, and he was told that there's none good but one, and that's God. So if you don't believe the truth when it's clearly presented and because you're resisting the truth, if you resist the truth, you can do it to your own damnation. Every time you go out soul winning, you find someone who, you know, repent your sins or whatever and they just refuse to believe the truth even when they're confronted by it. It's to their own damnation. But those who actually seek the truth will find truth. God promises that. Those who seek the Lord honestly will find him. 
But those who seek dishonestly, they prefer the lie because it's more convenient or because their sins are, you know, they, their deeds are evil, so they want to hide from the light. People love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But that's the thing, their foundation is corrupt and everything they're building will be untempered and will crumble down. I'll read to you from Hosea 4, 6. And it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Again, <laughs> like I know we're children of God, so you never lose your salvation, but you can still get to a point where God's done with you. He may kill you, he may take you home, or he just may leave you to live your life without him. And that's a horrible place to be too, with no protection from God, with nowhere to run to. You know, like you can always run back and repent and get right with God, but if you don't, this world's a wicked place and a lot of things can happen to you. So stay on God's good side by, you know, preaching his truth, not lying to his people. And there's a danger if you want to believe a lie that, yeah, God may not prevent you from believing it. He may give you over to it. And that's why it's important to prove things according to the Bible and not what you hear from men. So you're there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 8. It says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord hath shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, of course, this context is in the end of days. This is talking about, you know, the times of, of the beginning of sorrows and everything else where Jesus returns. It's talking about the Antichrist in particular. Um, but if you're willfully ignorant and you choose to believe the lie, God can just give you over to it. He says he'll send them strong delusion, just like he sent a lying spirit to those prophets. Did Ahab would believe the lie, he'd go into battle and die. Because you know, that was God's judgment. And again, God's always right. His judgment's always right. I don't look at his judgment and say, well, why'd you do that, Lord? It's not my place. I'm the, I'm the creature, not the creator. <laughs> so again, you know, if you, if you believe you have to repent of your sins to be saved, then God just might let you believe that to your own damnation because you love not the truth. If you hate God and don't believe the word, you might be given over to a reprobate mind. There's no coming back from that. You know, if you try and read the Bible dishonestly, looking for those hidden things of God, but you're not looking at it honestly, you're just looking to prove what you already believe, not to actually seek out what God's saying, then he may hide those things from you. You may never learn those mysteries and secrets of God because you've got to be honest with, with it. You know, God's not looking for you to justify yourself or justify your sin or anything like that using his word. You're misusing it. He wants you to seek his truth and just believe his truth, whatever it says, whether it hurts you or whether it's good for you. It's always good for us, but sometimes it hurts us too. And that can be where we, we sort of prick back and go, you know, well, that's a bit hard to take, but it is what it is. It says what it says. I just got to believe it. And God's always right. Because, yeah, God may hide that truth from you. So that's the first point. Obviously, the lying teacher and the false prophet. And point two, of course, is building upon that foundation. So uh, I'll read to you from Ephesians chapter 2, if you want to turn to 2 Timothy 4. In Ephesians 2.18, it says, for, him, for through him we have both access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So that's the thing, God dwells in us. You know, we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. You've got the Holy Spirit in us, it says. You know, we're in Him and He in us. Um, but that's the thing, that's why we need to build with tempered mortar, because we're building on the foundation of Christ. And we're building a house for Him to dwell in, which is our body, which He's purchased with His blood. But the foundation of doctrine and foundation of the church, that's Christ and the apostles and the prophets. And that's why we temper it with God's word, with biblical preaching and teaching. And as we come to church three times a week, then the men up here are teaching and preaching the word of God and they're tempering the mortar 
when they're going home and studying, they're tempering that mortar, and when they bring it and they daub you with it, then you're building strength upon strength. And that's why I love that we have such good men in the church here. We have such good preaching because we're always getting, you come three times a week, you're just daubing more, more tempered mortar and just building upon that. And that's why we're all just growing. We're all just getting from strength to strength. But it has to be from the Word of God. And there are so few churches where you actually get the Word of God. Like, not in the dose that we get it here. We get more Word of God here than in any other church that I've ever been in. Um, And just good doctrine-filled sermons. And, you know, too many preachers, they love their stories more than they love the Word. So they'll quote men from the past and they tell their stories. Some of their own and some they borrowed, you know, and they make their own. But it can sound good, but what is a profit? It's vanity at the end of the day. And truth comes from the Word of God. So to build on the foundation, on the cornerstone of the prophets and the apostles, you know, then, yeah, you've got to temper the mortar and build thereon. You want your house strong because you are going to be attacked. You know, when Jesus was attacked by the devil, he said, well, it's written. That was his answer. Every time he comes to him, he says, well, it's written. Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, and that's the same thing for us. Is when we're, we need to be able to withstand. How do you do that? Because you know the Bible. You read the Bible. You temper yourself with it. You understand it. You meditate on it. So that when, when the attacks come, whether they be from men or whether they be from, from demons or whatever, and they try and get you, you know, try and confuse you with bad doctrines and things like that, you're like, no, I know what the Bible says. I know the truth. So you're not going to follow after lies if you know the truth. And that's the difference between someone who doesn't know the truth. They can be misled. Somebody who knows the truth, the truth is established. There's no, they can't pull you away. And that's why we need to be shored up on that. It's so important. And I'm not saying that you can't use life experience to teach biblical truths. I think that's actually very helpful when you use your stories and life experiences to teach a biblical truth. But if you're up here for 30 minutes and 20 minutes of that's telling a story, and there's no scripture in there, then you're, you're out of balance. Because the word is powerful, but your anecdotes, frankly, they're meaningless. <laughs> and we're commanded not also not to take heed to Jewish fables or old wives' tales. But how many times, not in this church, but in other churches, have you heard, heard a lot of these vain, made-up stories? So I'm, I'm going to go... Uh, we will go through one of those shortly. But they're des- these stories are designed to hide the truth from you. In 1 Timothy 4, 7, it says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. You're there in 2 Timothy 4. Look at verse 1. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. <clears throat> we see uh, Titus 1.14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And Second Peter 1.16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables, When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his example, uh, eyewitnesses of his majesty. So we see an example of this kind of thing in in Mark, Luke, and the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. I won't read that story up because I've just covered a little bit as well, but in verse 24 it says, And again I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And this is something I see all the time abused and misused to teach false salvation. So the Bible clearly says a camel through the eye of a needle. And of course, you take that literally. That's a camel through the eye of a needle. Hardly shall a rich man enter into the kingdom of God. But what they make up is a story about the gates of Israel, and they call it the needle gate. And say that, you know, in order to get through the needle gate... You had to get on your hands and knees, you had to unburden yourself and you had to crawl on your hands and knees through the gate. The only problem with that is there's no history of that ever existing <laughs> in, any, in any record, including the Bible itself. So, 
And the, the second problem with that is it's used to teach a false works-based salvation. So you have to repent of all your sins, get on your hands and knees, unburden yourself from all your sins in order to receive salvation. But that's not the truth of salvation at all. It's designed to hide the truth from you. And anyone who says, who gives this example of that needle gate, I say is a wicked person because they're teaching lies and they're trying to pass it off as God's word. Now, Jesus said, I'm the door. He said, oh, whosoever will may come. You know, it's a free gift, but they want to pervert it with their fables and old wives' tales. In John 10, verse 7, it says, And Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came in before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. So all these lies, they're just thieves and robbers. Trying to, they're trying to rob you of your eternal life. Before you get saved, they're trying to rob you of knowing the truth, trying to rob you of going to heaven, trying to rob you of believing on Christ by teaching these lies. And that also means that we must, again, as I said before, we must temper our doctrine. We have to study and solidify it in the Word of God. And we need to be clear about what the Bible says. If you're going to open doors of questions, make sure you try and answer those questions. You know, we don't just leave people hanging at the end of a sermon. We just open this whole slew of questions and just go home. Like, that's not a good way to treat God's people. You want to make sure that you actually teach them well. And that, that's the thing. If you've tempered the mortar, you're, you're going to understand them. You're also going to come up with these questions yourself. Well, if I say this, maybe that's going to open a door. I'm just going to explain that away with God's word and then continue on because we need to teach clearly and we don't gender questions but answers so in 2 Timothy 2.15 study to show ourselves approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth because we want to make sure that when the people go away that they're well fed that the sheep understand what was being said that they have a clear understanding of what the Bible teaches because at the end of the day that's our job up here as preachers and I know that in this church, you know, the men do a great job of studying out the word and doctrine when they prepare. But if you're not clear, you can easily be mistaken for a wolf or a false prophet. If you're just not clear about what you're teaching and you slothfully throw around untempered mortar on the wall, you know, without tempering it first and understanding what you're preaching. Because at, at the end of the day, you're preaching to God's people. This is his house and the truth alone of God must be preached. Jeremiah 3.15 says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And that applies to us as much as it applies to them. The Lord sends preachers and pastors. They'll feed the flock of God with knowledge and understanding. But that's the thing. He requires us to build upon his foundation, not our own, and to temper our mortar. In First Thessalonians 5.21 it says, Prove all things and hold fast that which is good. So we test everything we hear. Everything you hear today, I expect you to go home and test it against the Scriptures. I expect you to test what I say when I'm teaching the Word of God, to test it against what the Bible says. Because if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And the Bible's always right. And that's why we need to try every spirit, whether they be of God. And just don't believe when someone gets up here to preach. Don't just believe what they say. Just try everything, prove all things, and hold on to that which is good. And that which is not, disregard. If it's against the, world, against the word of the Lord, then don't hold on to it. It's not good. Because at the end of the day, the, the Bible's our authority. The King James Bible is our authority in all manners of faith and practice. So I'm going to skip over a story here in Ezekiel 19. But it's about a mother and her young whelps. And it goes through some things where... Um, I'll just read one verse, uh, Ezekiel 19.10. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood, planted by the waters. She was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. So the mother line was strong and was planted by the rivers of water. That, that should also make you think of Psalm chapter 1. Um, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. In Ezekiel 17, 8, it says, It was planted in a good soil by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. 
So the offspring that this mother, mother lion trained to produce fruit like her, they were carried away into bondage. There's illustrations here about Israel and everything else. I won't go into that because we're not reading through the context. Um, but this, this is the thing. The bondage of the world, it might cause your children to be taken away, you know, from the Lord. Um, I just mean becoming unprofitable. Like you're obviously, we've got a lot of soul winners in the church here. And that's about bringing forth fruit. We bring forth fruit by preaching the word of God and getting people saved. Um, but this is talking about, you know, maybe if you don't raise your children up to the way you are or the way God says to, then they may depart from that. And even you could depart from that. In Mark 4.18 it says, These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So you need to teach your children to also build on the foundation of Christ with tempered mortar of his word and doctrine. So don't just do that as a father and a husband for yourself, but also teach your children, teach your wife to also do the same thing and guide them as well, uh, tempering their mortar. Because what you'll see is an unstable house, it will fall, it will collapse. And God even said himself that, you know, he's, he, for, for them, Israel, he said, I'm going to destroy that wall that was daubed with untempered mortar. I'm going to destroy it and it's going to fall down and not stand. So you need to, you know, it's not just about, you want to be stable because an unstable man is, un, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So you want to make sure you're as a husband and a father, you're stable, but also teaching stability to your wife and your children. And stability comes from establishing yourself in truth, uh, specifically God's word and doctrine. In Luke 6, 46, it says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I'll show you to whom he is like. He's like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on a rock. And of course, it's talking about this rock is Christ. He's our cornerstone. But in 49, but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So another part of tempering your mortar is not just hearing the good preaching, but also doing what God commands. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into, a, into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So that's how we solidify our house. You know, the house that we are of God. It says... If you want to stand the long test of time and not just be some flash in the pan, you get saved, you go to church for six months and you're never seen or heard from again. If you want to be in here for the long haul, and we're talking, you know, we're here f going to be here for decades. That's our intention, you know, until we die at the end of it. We're, we're here for the long haul, but that's why we've got to serve God and do His works as long as we're here. Because you've got to be a hearer of the word and a doer also. And I'm just going to conclude with these points. Because the whole point of us being here is, is that's why we're here. We're here, you know, obviously to get other people saved, to share the good news, but also to serve each other as brethren, to minister to each other. So at these points I'll conclude with, the Lord will tear down the walls built with untempered mortar. And the application of this is good doctrine will destroy bad doctrine. So when you know the truth and you self-study the truth and knowing the word of God, that's going to destroy any of these untempered mortar that tried, they try and throw at your wall, it's not going to stick because you already know the truth. You've already tempered it with the temperance of, of God's word. So, and we also have the foundation of stone, the cornerstone, the immovable stone of the word of God and Jesus Christ. It's unshakable. So we build on top of that using the King James Bible and we don't build with the untempered mortar of false prophets who are only serving their own belly. And you don't need to know what every fraud looks like. You only need to be familiar with what the truth is, because everything that's not the truth is a lie. So you don't need to know every lie out there. You don't need to understand how the world sees things or, or you know, what the lies are. You just need to know what the truth is, and everything that's not the truth is a lie. And it's so much easier. 
And it's like, you know, I've heard this example before, you take a banknote. So you know what a real banknote looks like. So when someone hands you a fake one, and it's not a very good fake, you can tell immediately that it's not real. Because you don't have to know what every fake looks like. You only have to know what the real one looks like and feels like and smells like. So when someone hands you a fake one, you know immediately this is not the same as the truth. It's the same thing, that's what we do. Yeah, that's why we study the, study the word and we hold fast to every truth. Because the truth will stand on its own. The Bible, God's word, stands on its own. It doesn't need us to defend it. It defends itself. You know, so we just speak what it says is truth. And we're not to hide the truth. So in Luke 11, 33, it says, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. And that's what our church aims to do. You know, that's what you hear in private. We teach, we shout it from the rooftops, as well as, you know, obviously that's also about soul winning. We have the light in us. We share that light with others. And uh, I'll read from Psalm 55. Verse 17, it says, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old Selah, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. He hath put forth his hand against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. The word of, the, of his mouth was smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But thou, our God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. And that's a beautiful promise for us. You know, these people, yeah, they're going to lie to you. They're going to try and draw you away after themselves. You know, it says their mouth smoother than butter, but there's war in his heart. You know, softer than oil, but they're drawn swords. Like, these people want to hurt you, but they're going to lie to you and they're going to appear like they're good, decent people. But just know that the Lord says, I'm going to destroy them. They won't live out half their days. We just trust in God. Yeah, so those who teach lies, they continue to believe lies. They're just, they're just going to keep doing that. And all we have to do is just preach the truth and righteousness. And they can choose to believe it, they can scoff, they can mock, they can take that up with God. It's not our problem. We don't have to defend the word of God. It defends itself. God takes care of the wicked. I'll just read from uh, Revelation 22, 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So the moral for us is you can't fool those people, you know, those who have established the truth in their heart, those that are built upon the foundation of God and of the prophets on Jesus Christ, they can't fool us because we know the truth. So that's why it's so important that we study the truth, we know mm. what the Bible says, and the truth should be everything to us. For me, the truth is above everything. You know, I just want to know what God says. I just want to know what the truth is. I don't want to know the lies. I don't want to know anything else except what God says and live my life the best I can according to that. Because when you know the truth, the lies just become obvious. We just preach the truth and let God deal with the rest. So, uh, Brother Rob, do you mind praying for us?